Happy summer, everyone. The 21st is come and gone, and we are officially in the summer days, and it feels like it. Welcome to our Wednesday evening teaching, and say so glad that you could join us, all our uh, Wade's Berean saints and the free range followers of Jesus who are joining us. Uh, got some good feedback about the intertestamental teaching before we launch into Romans later. Uh, I just do want to give you a heads up that next Wednesday, the Wednesday following the 4th, that we will not have a Wednesday evening teaching. Uh, just going to go ahead and let you know that we're going to take uh, a one week break while people are here, there, and yonder and come back uh, to, to uh, I guess, say, uh, again, an intertestamental teaching. But uh, I want to let you know that right up front. And secondly, Tonight, as we're getting together, I uh, just want to remind us all to be proactive in reaching out to our fellow church members and, and na uh, our neighbors and our fellow followers that the intentionality of care is something that we as the church continue need to demonstrate to a, a fractured and hurting community and not just our local community but beyond. And that being the body of Christ has never been so as important to show the unity of our of our faith, the unity of our love together, and remembering the scriptural promise that when the community see how we love each other, then they're drawn to that, that loving community. Uh, it is absolutely God's work to do the convicting, and it is ours to do the loving. So in this moment tonight, as we begin with prayer tonight, we remember those who are in the hospital, we remember those who are in our nursing homes and still unable to be with loved ones, even though some things have opened up, uh, the visitation is still very limited to people who are suffering in hospitals and care facilities, and their caregivers are suffering particularly because they can't do the hands-on care that families are used to providing. Uh, continue to pray for our frontline responders and those who are in the front lines of, of fire, so to speak. So at this time, will you join me for prayer as we join together uh, this Wednesday evening? Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us, being with us wherever we're gathered, that there is no separation from us in the love and care that you give us, that you continue to unite us as, as one body of believers wherever we happen to be tonight. Thank you for the ability for our youth to go to uh, Cure Beach and for the power of your spirit, I pray, is ministering to them uh, as they are gathered there, even though all the camps are shut down, that we would allow that just the foresight and the willingness of the adult leaders to say, you know, we're going to follow you, Lord, and allow these youth to gather in a space that will allow them to be safe and secure, but also to come away for a particular time of teaching. Father, continue to be with our, our church as we are continually having to uh, pivot and learn more about ourselves and what it means to worship in place instead of worshiping in our place that is so familiar. Lord, we give you thanks and praise because you are continuing to, continuing to raise up leaders and provide leadership in this moment. And Father, I just ask that you put your arms around everyone in the sound of my voice and let each one experience a, a nearness to you unlike that has ever been felt by that person. And we thank you and we praise you. We give you all the glory and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take just a moment before we dive into the lesson uh, from the intertestamental period or the what I call the time between the times. Uh, we did a survey last week. It was a two-question survey that most of you, I hope, have responded to. And if you haven't, check your email. But the two-question survey was about uh, our congregation's readiness to return to worship at our place. And the second was really about uh, a part of that worship, which is singing. 
And just to, to share with you some of that result, our target date six weeks ago was June 28th to resume our worship in our place. But we felt like that we needed to continue to stay in touch and, and test the pulse of, of our congregation's readiness to gather back live, even though we know that it would be different. Uh, to that end, the, uh, a task force was formed those weeks ago to begin looking at the project map or the process mapping of what it would require for us to return safely. And that task force began to work diligently on the logistics of such a return, looking at the entire process from getting out of your car to getting back into your car and what would occur in the steps that would take place to allow for a safe return. And in that, uh, in that process mapping, in that logistics task, we set the date of, of June 28th. But as we know, um, as we looked at emerging trends and such that we needed to send out a different or an additional survey talking or asking about our readiness. Now this is one of those important moments that I just want to say that there are other congregations who have made the choice to go ahead and resume live worship and that's wonderful. We wanted to test our readiness because as a congregation we are responsible, the leaders, the, the servant leaders of this congregation are responsible for the care and for the, the health and safety of our congregation. And so in doing that survey, we found out that there was a significant amount of reticence and hesitation about returning on the 28th. And so in that survey, there are some choices. And if you haven't taken it, please still do. We're still uh, collecting data. But from the data that we received all the way up through Sunday, it was a very clear uh, result that a significant portion of our congregation is, is still hesitant and felt that the 28th was too soon. So what we've done is set a, uh, another target date of July 12th. And that's, a, that's actually three more Sundays uh, out from, from where we are right now to be able to assess what, what people are doing. And I've already heard from some folks saying, well, you know, so-and-so church is already meeting. I, I want us to, to, uh, to hear this together. We will not be shamed into or bullied into or made to feel guilty for lack, some lack of faith for not meeting face to face. We are doing as a congregation and getting congregational input that which is important to our particular part of the body of Christ that may not fit the demographic, that may not fit the, uh, the, the kind of space that we have. And it is our prayer life and our sense that we want to honor uh, the, the, the sentiment of this congregation. We will continue to offer online uh, teaching and preaching and worship. I'll continue to visit the sick and those who uh, want porch visits. And we want our care teams to continue to take care of those who are in our midst, who are sick and who are hurting. The church phone continues to roll directly to my cell phone so that there's no lag in that communication. And for those of you who may have noticed the latest um, communication phone tree that has been upgraded and refined, that there will be a call every Friday morning at 9 a.m. And so if you don't have an answer machine uh, and it calls you twice, it's not, it doesn't have somewhere to leave a message, so you won't be receiving a message. Or if you're on your phone and don't have a rollover message machine, you're just a busy signal to, to the phone tree, and so it won't call you back. So we want to encourage you to set aside 9 a.m. if you would like to get the message and updated uh, messages from the church weekly at 9 a.m. each Friday. We appreciate your cooperation in that. As, again, we continue to learn more about who we are, whose we are, and how we can operate in this space of worshiping in place. So 
we welcome your feedback, your input, we welcome uh, your suggestions, but we want to be faithful to Christ. We want to be faithful to God in our community and continue to serve in our community in a way that glorifies God and gives a witness to our faith in Jesus in, in the midst of this pandemic that is still going on. Um, Carla and I recently returned, uh, actually yesterday, from Baltimore. And this is not some hoax. This is a reality that, that the whole world is living with and the whole country is living with. And there are people in every state, every nation, still trying to figure out what the best practices are. And so being uh, a congregation that is independent and is able to make its own decisions, we're deciding to go slowly. So we appreciate your input and co cooperation and hope you find a blessing in that. So, intertestamental period. Last week when we considered the years, the 400 years between Ezra and Nehemiah and the, the last words of Malachi uh, being that God's spirit would be poured out and he'd be preparing, what we really leaned into as a message and a listening was what do we do with God when we sense or perceive or experience the dark night of the soul, the silence of God? And that's where we leaned into that last week. This week, I, I, I want to, since I've taken a lot of time already with the uh, public service announcement, I want us to, to look at what, what were the Jewish people, with what were they grappling? How were they, how were they responding to that silence as a people? not just as individuals, but as a people. And just as a refresher to remember that in that 400 years, when they ceased to exist as an independent nation in 586 BC with the fall of Jerusalem, with Nebuchadnezzar crushing, destroying the walls, destroying the temple, and they were put into exile, I wanna, I wanna give you a $55 word. Uh, it's, the word is diaspora. And simply, Put, think of dispersion. The, the, the diaspora, which is referred to in the Jewish community history, was the dispersion of all of the Jewish nation. They, they had been taken, the northern ten kingdoms had been taken by Assyria and they had been assimilated into other countries and people from that empire had moved into the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, which is Judah, where Jerusalem is, when Babylon conquered them, they remember they took all the breath, best and brightest, among whom was Daniel, and we saw how that worked. The dispersion. So here's the question for this week. If, if public worship and prayer had been the primary center of being around Jewish identity in the form of the temple, in other words, there's the place where you sacrifice. There's the place where you were required as at least a, as an adult male to go two times a year for uh, two of the, the primary festivals. And it was there in that public worship that you made sacrifices for atonement of sin. And that you would experience that sacrifice and that, um, that covering that atonement, making at one month with God. And twice a year he went there. And we saw that when, when the, the temple was uh, destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar's reign, it wasn't built till uh, 120 years later with Ezra and Nehemiah, that when it was finished, it was a smaller temple. But also the people had experienced that length of time living with the question of what does it mean to be a faithful adherent to Judaism when I don't have a temple? So think about this, okay? We don't have a church built. What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus if we have no place to meet? Some people have uh, an idea that, that, that it's the gathering in the building that is what makes that worship alive and, and worship experience 
So there, and it does. I don't want to discount that. But it is an experience of the Jewish people when they lost the temple. They had to, to, to question and re-evaluate how can I be faithful? How can I be atoned and have atonement for my sin? How can I understand more about what God's will is and who I am in, in God's will? So during that, that 400 years of silence, there were, there were groups that were starting to develop and to wrestle with that question. So when in 323, Alexander the Great had conquered the Persian Empire, his role, and we talked about this a little bit last week, his goal was a, 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 a circumstance or a culture that was called Hellenization, where everybody, everything in that whole empire would be Greek speaking, Greek culture, Greek philosophy, uh, Greek religion, even though there was a lot of uh, latitude and freedom for the Jewish community, they were still expected to live into the Greek culture. When, when Alexander the Great died, as is often the case with a great uh, leader, things split apart. He had two generals, uh, Ptolemy and Seleucid, that the Ptolemy took the, the, the southern or the northern kingdom of Judah and the Holy Land, and the Seleucid took the southern. And there was a, a fair amount of religious freedom until about 163 BC. But during that period of the Seleucids and Ptolemies, there, there began to develop a new reality. Now we don't know what the new normal or new reality will be following the, the COVID-19. We don't know what the legacy results. We, we will know. We don't know because we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know the forms uh, that it's going to take. But we know it's a, it's, it's a big disruption to what used to be because we're used to gathering in buildings. For the Jewish people, it was, a, it was an exploration that began to look at how do we study scriptures differently. Now think about this. There were no priests. The last time we hear of the priests in the Old Testament is under Ezra when they had, they were dedicating the temple and the walls and Ezra began to read from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible and if you remember they were all cut to the heart and they were, you know, what do we do and they were renewing covenants and then we, we fast forward we see how in Nehemiah's lifetime that began to fall apart and it fell apart even more under the Greek influence and the Seleucid influence and the Ptolemy influence and the Egyptian influence but there were people who were hungry about remaining faithful. So how in the world are you going to remain faithful in that, in that culture? Well, this is where the synagogue was born. And this is tonight's lesson because this is one of those things that sets the stage for an understanding of Jesus' time and Romans, the, and Paul's writing in the book of Romans. This is going to set the stage, and I want you to understand how this developed so that when we talk about the Pharisees, when we talk about the Sadducees, when we talk about the temple that Herod rebuilt and reestablished temple worship and, and what Paul would emerge in, it's very, very important for us to understand how the synagogue came to be. When people wanted to meet, and the word synagogue simply means a gathering place. That's, that's what it literally means. The, uh, and it's a, that's more of a Greek word, synagogos, uh, that means gathering place. When people began to meet, there was not a priest. There weren't priests who owned the scriptures. There weren't priests that, that, that said, this is the only interpretation that you can have about a certain scripture. In fact, the, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about two weeks from now is how the Old Testament became canonized during this time. It means that the books of the Bible were set beyond the Torah, in which ones were considered legitimate and authoritative and ones that weren't. And this is a, this is a moment when, when people turned to God's word 
for themselves and begin to read and study. And uh, I, I would I'd want to say, even though that I've been part of other denominations, this is one of those moments where we can talk about, in, at least in the Baptist tradition, having the, the Bible freedom. The, the synagogue was around the Bible freedom. They would, they would read and they would discuss and then they, were, they would grow over the years schools of thought, uh, rabbinic schools, schools that great rabbis with teachers would begin to emerge from the synagogues. But the synagogue was not so much of a building as it was of the community. So if you were if you were living in the diaspora, the dispersion, and you were in some small community in, in Babylon, modern day Iran or, uh, or Iraq, and you were and you were over there and you found ten other Jewish families, which was a kind of a a minimum, and you wanted to create a community. Well, the building wasn't the first, the synagogue wasn't the first thing that would be established. The first thing that would be established was a, a thing called a mikvah, which is really a pool. It's, it was a living source of water, a well, as it were. The mikvah became a source of purification, uh, a source of life, and recognition of dependence on God. But that would be the first thing that this community would create as a mikvah. The second thing, that that Jewish community would create would be a school for the children to start raising up the next generation, which was an important part of God's word about passing on. Do you realize each one of us, each one of our churches, each one of our, 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 our local congregations is just one generation away from extinction? That if we don't raise up the children and teach the children in the ways they should go, if we don't train them in the ways of God, remember the scripture said you train up a child in the way they should go and in their old age they return to it? I don't know about y'all, but it took me a, while, a minute. <laughs> there were times that I was uh, tra training, being trained up with a switch, and there were sometimes I was being trained up by the word of God, and sometimes I was wondering. But the older I got, the more I understood the lessons that I've been taught and had been sown into me as a child that I was able to lean on. And so this, the schooling of children was the second part of creating the community for a Jewish community in diaspora. The third one is a little surprising. Create a charity foundation. In other words, if we're going to get together as 10 families, if we're going to form a Jewish community in this, in this village, in this place where we live, and we've created a mikvah, and we've created a school for our children, the third, third thing is, what are we doing for the rest of the community? How are we really helping each other to live out our life of faithfulness to God by loving God and loving our neighbor? And only fourth, fourth in line, was creating a meeting place. And for the most part, early on, it was someone's home. Later on, there would be uh, more structures that had been built. And it's interesting that the architecture of the synagogue was bor borrowed almost corresponding one-to-one -one by the early churches. Our roots, our faith heritage, our being, our identity as Christ followers is rooted in our Jewish roots and our Jewish history. You see, the question that they were answering was much larger than we even, even tend to think. It was a question of identity. Who am I as a Jew if I can't go to the temple? What is my relationship with God if I can't go to the temple and sacrifice and have that experience of sacrifice that gives me peace about atonement in my relationship with God. These deep questions of identity and how do I live out a life of faithfulness are the very seeds of the beginning of what we will see expressed in the New Testament life. 
You see the, the revolt that happened in 163, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was one of the Seleucid leaders. He wanted to erase Judaism. He wanted to absolutely eradicate Judaism. And you know what? No one can do that. No one can eradicate God's own purposes and will. There may be people who want to tear us down as a church, want to, want to get rid of us as a church. There may be times of persecution like the Jewish people have seen their whole lives. But you see, the faithful questions of what it means to live faithful in a world that we can't control or doesn't look the same like the Jewish people with the temple still leaves us with an open relationship that God wants to have with us. It is not God who pivoted. It is not God who changed. But it became the, in the midst of the circumstances in which people were living in the dispersion, they, the diaspora, that they began to ask different questions. And rather than going to the routine and through the, the rigor of just trying to fulfill the, raw, the, the law of sacrificial system, they began to, to look at the heart and the expectation that God can be met outside of the Holy of Holies. And friends, that paved the way for God sending his only son that whosoever so when we get back together next time I hope you're asking those same questions about how can I be a faithful follower of God where I am in the circumstances in which I now live and still be a faithful follower of Jesus God bless you. See you Sunday.